Wherever you are, wherever you're watching us from, you're welcome to Beacon Life Church, Nairobi, Kenya. We are committed to shining Jesus' light as we advance the glorious gospel of the kingdom. 
our services on Sunday 10 a.m. Power Thursday, which is also our midweek prayer service at 6 p.m. You're welcome to log into our life groups, Beacon at Home, Beacon at Work. Don't you hesitate to get in touch with us for the details of the life group that is closest to you. Feel excited to join us on our social media handles to subscribe, like, comment, and follow Beacon Life Church on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Let's now celebrate the Lord with our generous giving. The Mpesa Pay Bill number is 535471. You can also give through PayPal by following the link on our website, www.beaconlifechurch.org. For cash, checks, and transfers, our bank details are displayed on the screen. Thanks a bunch for joining us today. Welcome to Beacon Life Church. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. We thank you, for Lord, for your word. We know that the entrance of your word giveth light and imparteth understanding to the simple. Out of the simplicity of our hearts today, we receive understanding, we receive impartation, we receive a revelation that will change our lives even to the glory of your mighty name. I thank you, Lord, for the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endureth forever. Now I speak that enduring grace upon our hearts, upon our lives, upon this church, and upon this commission, because by your word we live. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a guide unto our path. We live it, we believe it, we walk it, and we celebrate it in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe with me, say a good amen. All right, Acts chapter number 18. Acts chapter number 18, and I will read from verse number 5. And the Bible declares, when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. We're going to read all the way to 11. So let's go together. Verse number six. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. I want to mark that very clearly. Verse number seven. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined heart to the synagogue. Number eight. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night, in the, in, in, uh, in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Somebody say amen to that. And verse number 11, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Hallelujah. So last week, uh, we took time looking at the story of Ruth and we spoke on the subject of divine uh, providence and we looked at how God gave conception uh, to Ruth and like I said that many times when we read that story we do not realize uh, that Ruth had uh, the inability uh, to conceive because we see uh, she's married to Boaz and the scripture says and Boaz went unto her and uh, she conceived uh, uh, a son. But now we understand that that was the hand of God for providence because we know now from chapter number one that Ruth had actually been married to, uh, uh, to Marlon, you remember? Marlon for about 10 years that they lived in the land of Moab where they had gone to find food and for 10 years they did not have a child. I gave the background of why and why the scholars believe that was like that. But then we came to the gist and the conclusion of what I was pressing for last Sunday, uh, that it is divine providence that God gave a conception to Ruth. And I said that that must be our heritage too, that there is divine providence in your own lives, that the areas that need conception God will strike it. And the uh, uh, places in your life that need a miracle of that kind, God will strike it and release it. And the uh, places in your life that look completely gone and despised and uh, they are in an unbelievable state, 
God will strike it and release what we call an enablement, what we call the divine ability of God that releases what we call divine providence. I want to take a few minutes today and teach in a light of what I want to call divine plan. Say together with me, divine plan. So there is divine providence, God getting involved in a natural state of things and aligning things to the glory of his name that he may allow supernaturally to provide for his agenda. Uh, how the ram was found in the thicket for Abraham on Mount Moriah. So that is one place that we call divine providence. But there is another place that we call divine plan. And I want to use the text we have just read here. Take me back to verse number, number did we start at number eight, number five? Number five, number five, number five. So when Silas and Timothy were come out of Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. All right, look at verse number six. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go to the Gentiles. So we have a situation here where the man of God, uh, Paul, is pressed in his heart. He feels the conviction that he should minister to the Jews. Uh, he's in a place called Corinth. Uh, this is the place that he meets uh, Aquila and uh, uh, what was his wife? Priscilla. Priscilla. Yeah. And in that place, uh, he finds some Jews there and is pressed in his heart that he may minister to them and testify to them or rather preach to them that Jesus is the Christ. All right. And he goes ahead to begin to do that. But then in verse number six, we see the response because they opposed themselves. They blasphemed. They resisted the message that Paul was trying to give to them. Uh, they blasphemed and they opposed and we don't have the details of the their uh, behavior there but the Bible says he shook his raiment and they said unto them your blood be upon your hands I am clean from henceforth I will go to the Gentiles in other words I will not belabor with the Jews I will go to the Gentiles now we know that uh, of course that is a part of God's divine plan because when God is speaking to uh, to, to Paul when uh, Ananias met him in Damascus you remember part of what he told him is that God had a special plan for him and to use him as a special instrument among the Gentiles all right so no doubt about that but I want you to see here that uh, uh, even when the ministering to the Gentiles is God's divine plan for the Apostle Paul God still has an agenda for these people that are opposed themselves and they are blaspheming the gospel uh, the truth of the manifestation that Jesus is the Christ even in Corinth glory to God we know that this is critical because the church in Corinth, we know in history that uh, the church in Corinth had many trials and many troubles and many uh, wicked practice and he writes to them uh, two letters saying many things about their uh, conversation uh, in their life with the Lord. But this is critical to understand that this is a part of the birthing place of what we call the church in Corinth. Am I talking? So if we don't have this experience, probably we wouldn't have Corinthians chapter, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians and the second letter to the Corinthians because it is in him reaching out uh, to the people that were in Corinth that the church in Corinth was actually born. Somebody say amen to that or hallelujah to that. So... Paul feels they have resisted the gospel. They have blasphemed what I have to declare. Uh, they have not been good to me. Uh, they are resisting the truth of the, uh, of, of the word, which is that Jesus is the Christ. And listen to what he says. He says, your blood is on your hands. I am clean. And from henceforth, I wipe my hands and I'm going to move on to the Gentiles. Now, that in principle is also right. Because Jesus told and he said that in a city or any place or any home you go to and you are rejected, what do you do? You wipe the dust from off of your feet and wash your hands from off of them and you will be clean as you walk away from them because their blood then will be upon their heads. And Paul provokes that principle here. But let's go to verse number 7 and see how this story unravels. Because in verse number 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house. He was named Justus, one that worshipped God whose house is joined hard to the synagogue. Glory to God. 
Uh, and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing uh, believed and were baptized. So we have a guy called Justus and we have another one called Crispus. They are hard attached to the synagogue. Uh, so much so that Crispus is the chief ruler of the synagogue. So these are actually Jews, all right? For them to have such heavy responsibility over the synagogue. Because the synagogue is the representation of Jews. Jewish worship. So we are not talking the Corinthians yet. We are talking the Jews that Paul is trying to run away from. He's washed his hands from them and he said your blood is upon your heads. But when he enters the house of one called Justus, uh, uh, he, he pressed hard upon, uh, the Bible said that uh, he worshipped God and his heart was so pressed onto the synagogue. And then he goes on to go ahead. Okay, verse number seven. He departed this. <laughs> You're confusing now. Let's begin at seven. Let's go to seven. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God whose house joined to the synagogue. Let's go to eight. So we have Justus there. And then we have Crispus, the ruler, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house, and many of the Corinthians believed uh, and were baptized. So we have the Gentiles here as the Corinthians beginning to believe after those that are attached to the synagogue, which are the Jews, in reality, which is firstborn among the nations. Glory to God. Uh, and we will look at that at a later space. Glory to God. That God wants a certain work to be done in Corinth but it has to begin with particular men and women and families that are Jewish attached to the synagogue because out of them is going to open a marvelous door so that the Corinthians will be able to receive the gospel and be baptized take me to verse number nine Bible declares, then speak the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Let's go to verse number 10. For I am with thee and no man shall set upon thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Hallelujah. So Paul in his mind, his, his, he pursuant to the Jews, no doubt, and he's trying to reach out to the Jews in every city that he goes to. He finds the synagogue and he begins to preach in the synagogues. One of these cities is Corinth. But when he goes there, the Jews blaspheme him and they resist him and they don't seem to be excited about uh, the gospel or the message that he has to present. He says, you know what? From henceforth, the blood is going to be on your heads. I'm going to wash my hands and I will go to the Gentiles. Paul is thinking like that. But listen to what God is telling him. He's telling him, do not take me back to verse number nine. Verse number nine. The Lord spoke to him by night in a vision and he said be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace you must speak and hold not thy peace why verse number 10 for i am with thee and no man shall be shall set on thee to hurt thee for i have much people in this city let's conclude that matter now verse number 11 and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of god among them so ladies and gentlemen we are talking divine plan. The man of God has a sensation in his heart to be able to preach to the people in that city. There is resistance and there is blasphemy. They don't receive him. Uh, they talk him down. Uh, they don't celebrate him. They don't seem to receive the gift. Uh, and he's tired of uh, pursuing a space like that. And he says, I know by matter of principle, Jesus taught, if you don't receive me, I will dust my shoes. I will wipe my hands. Your blood will be on your heads and I will move on. I will go to the places where I'm celebrated, where I'm honored and where the gospel will be received. The place where my calling is, I will go to the Gentiles. But listen to God's plan. He says, Paul, don't you be afraid. You must stay here. You must stay bold. You must stay strong. You must speak the word here because I have a purpose and a plan for here. As a matter of fact, you are worried about persecution in Corinth, how they may beat you and throw you in jail like they did in Philippi. But I tell you, no man will be set upon you to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. Now, there are much people in the city, but some of these people have not really believed the Lord, but they are on God's rudder, and God calls them his people. They are on God's plan and God's agenda, and God has marked them out, and Paul must stay there to achieve divine purpose and achieve divine agenda, because God has much people in that city. Somebody say, Amen. 
Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say amen. Look at verse number 11. He continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He wanted to leave as soon as he saw resistance. But when the plan of God was revealed, he stayed there one year and six months, ladies and gentlemen, bathing what we know as the church of Corinth. Glory to God. When later on he's in Rome and he's writing to them, he tells them things like, you may have many instructors, but you don't have many fathers. Because in the Lord, I am your father. Because for one and a half years, he stayed there laboring, building and birthing what would become the church in Corinth and yet in the beginning when the Jews resisted his stay he wanted to pack up his bags he shook up his mantle and his raiment and he wanted to leave and go to the Gentiles I want to talk to you today about divine plan because in everything that you see around your life it is one thing that you see with your natural eye it's another thing that God has in mind as his plan am I talking to someone here a glory hallelujah Come on, somebody, glory, hallelujah. There is a grand plan for your life. God has a plan for cities. God has a plan for nations. God has a plan for families. He has a plan, what I call a blueprint. Glory to God. It's like a set out plan and an arrangement in the spirit on how things should be and how things should be arranged. In the, in the situation with Paul, he says, don't you be, don't you leave now. Don't you be quick to leave. Nobody is going to hurt you because I have much people in the city. You must stay here until we've gathered all these much people. You must stay here until the church ecclesia in Corinth has been born out. You must go by print. I know that by principle, you want to wash your hands and dust your shoes and walk out and go look for a place where you're going to be received and accepted. But there is a difference between principle and plan. Now, sometimes principle and plan may be able to work together, but sometimes a plan may go above principle as an exception because God has an agenda and he has a plan and he has a strategy to be able to achieve something in a certain place. I feel like I'm teaching good already. Somebody say hallelujah. That's why we have miracles because miracles are usually above and beyond principle glory to god when elisha causes the iron to float on the river jordan after the man has cried and said the last master it was borrowed the miracle of the earth breaks the laws and the principles of gravity and everything known in science of why an iron cannot float because god needs to do something in that season in that hour with his man with his person and with his people you must agree with me that god has a plan for you god has an agenda for you god has a plan for your life god has a strategy for your life even though what is happening around you may not look like that even though what's happening around you may look like the one to throw you out leave our city we don't need you here god is saying don't you move stay right here because i have much people in the city one and a half years and you'll be surprised what i will do in the city of corinth somebody to say hallelujah in Jeremiah chapter number one we hear the marvelous sayings of the Lord to the prophet as a young man he says before you were formed in your mother's womb I knew thee and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations now listen to me my brothers and sisters and hear me well there is a plan for your life that God has before you are even formed in your mother's womb hallelujah I say hallelujah so you are not here to exist and walk through life. You are not here to survive and make it somehow. You are not here to someday get married, get children, drive a Honda or a, a Toyota or something and then reach 75 and get cancer and somehow check out like everybody does. You must believe and understand that God has a plan for your life and your life is right on the on the on the on the on the on the, on the calendar, on divine calendar, on divine right where you are where you go what you do who you connect with how your life turns around glory to God why you are here why you are born in the family you are born why you are Kenyan and not Ugandan or not American all of that is part of God's divine plan to arrange something so that your life may be able to achieve what we call purpose hallelujah come and bless the name of Jesus 
In Psalm chapter number 40, the Bible declares in verse number 7 and verse number 8, he says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written on, of me. Verse number 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. He says, Yeah, your law is within my heart in the volume of the book it's written of me he says law i come to do thy will of course we know that that text is messianic because jesus uh, 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 referred himself to that the book of hebrews refers to jesus as one that came to do the will of god and this is how he says he say lo behold i come to do your will O god because in the volume of the book it is written of me if it is true of jesus it is true of you let me give you a revelation. There is a volume of the book. And in that book, there is a chapter. And that chapter reads, then is desire. And that chapter prescribes what the plan of God is for his servant. Are you listening to me? Your name is in his book. Your name is in his palm. Your name is in his plan. Your name is in his agenda. Your name is in his strategy. Glory to God. You are not floating around like a floating plant on the waving and billowing seas. Uh, you are not just surviving through life so that somehow you made it until somehow you're managing through life. One day you get rich and celebrate that after all, you are no longer poor even though you are born like that i'm talking above and beyond that i'm talking divine plan i'm talking you walking in the mind and in the purpose of god because when god put you together before you came in your mother's womb for jeremiah he was a prophet ordained for the nations for you and me there is a plan in god's mind that as he was putting you together he had something for you to do Hallelujah. The scientist that created the microphone in his mind had an idea of what a microphone is going to be used for. Are you listening? I know when you get your pencil sharpened very well, you like to put it in your head and scratch your ear, scratch your hair, you, you, you scratch your back with your pencil. But when the guy was designing a pencil, he knew exactly what its purpose was. And it was not to scratch the hair and scratch the back. Hallelujah. Come on. Purpose should define existence. Purpose reveals plan, or rather plan reveals purpose. Our responsibility, therefore, is to tap into divine wisdom that reveals plan. Oh, hallelujah. And for that matter, divine plan. Jeremiah 29, this is a favorite one. Every one of you should quote it off your head. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. I will read from the version that says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. Verse number 13, and you shall seek me and you will find me when you shall seek me with all of your heart. I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from the nations and from the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I'll bring you again into a place where I cause you to be carried away captive. Is that the King James I've been reading? Hallelujah. So he says, I know the plans I have. Let, let me first of all begin there. Let me begin there. He says, I know. Somebody say with me, I know. So God knows the plans he has for you. All right? God knows the plans he has for you. Question is, do you know the plans that God knows that he has for you? Do you see what I'm saying? No doubt that God knows. The million dollar question is, do you know? Hallelujah. Because if you don't know, that is going to become the misnomer and the greatest misfortune of your life. Because when you don't know, you will exist through life. You may live until 120, but if you don't do what God designed you for, that has not been a, an abundant life. It's been an existence. Divine purpose is the revelation of God's heart. What he had on his mind when he got you to become his thought. One translation says, I know the plans I have for you. 
I like this one that says, I know the thoughts I think toward you because plans are thoughts. Are you listening? They are thoughts. In this verse, he says, I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. So let me ask you a question. All these thoughts you have about yourself, how you are going to die before your time, how you'll never get married, how you can never do anything good, where did they come from? Because those are not the thoughts that God has toward you. Glory to God. Plans are thoughts because they are thought and then they are put on paper and then they become a plan. A plan of a house is a blueprint. Glory to God. And the architect thinks it out. The client defines it. He says, I want a house with very large windows. I want a house with a, a, a one, st uh, maybe two, two, st two, two floors. And I want a house with a, a, a master bedroom with a closet that I can walk in and turn around. I, want, I mean, it describes it. As it describes it, it is a thought in the mind. The architect captures that thought, puts it on paper, it becomes a plan. The builders come to execute a plan that was a thought that becomes a house. Take that picture in your own life. An ideal situation is that God has thought a thought. God has a plan in his mind concerning your life. And he's speaking it like an owner of a house. You are the architect by the Holy Spirit that begins to pick it from the master so that you can begin to understand it and begin to create it and let the builders begin to execute it. Problem is the owner of the house is thinking the architect is not catching it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He tells them, I know the plans I think towards you. Plans to give you hope. Plans to give you a future. He says in verse number 13, you will seek me. You will find me. If you search me with all of your heart, I will be fond of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. Listen to God's thoughts. I will turn away your captivity. I will turn away your pain. I will gather you from the nations where you have been scattered and you've been made captive there. I will gather you out there. Those are the good plans I have towards you. He's speaking concerning the nation of Israel here. And I want to tell you that Israel is an example because I told you that God has a plan for nations. One of the plans for the nation of Israel is to become an, a, an example to the nations of the world of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's kindness, of God's salvation plan. That's why the Messiah was for the Jews, which is Israel, glory to God, so that if they understand the revelation of the Messiah, that nations can be partakers of what the firstborn has received. Glory to God. That the nations will gather to the mountain of the Lord. Ma 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 Micah chapter number 4. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, work with Micah chapter number 4. And Isaiah chapter, chapter number something. That the mountain of the Lord will be exalted above all mountains. And the nations of the world will begin to gather to the mountain to see of the doing of the Lord. That his scepter will abide in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And his dominion will abide in, in Jerusalem. Why must it be Jerusalem? Because it is God's plan. I know it is a small nation. I know it's a hated nation. I know it's, I mean, there's too much theology and psychology and many ideas about Israel. But bottom line is, it is simply God's plan. Because he wants to use it as an example of God's redemption plan to the nations. Glory to God. The same way God has a plan for the nation of Israel. He has a plan for the nation of Kenya. He has a plan for the nation of Africa. He has a plan for the nation of England. Glory to God. I believe part of God's plan for England was to actually take the gospel around the world. Because as they were pushing to come for the scramble and the partitioning and the colonization of Africa, as they were coming politically, they were also coming, uh, carrying something greater than colonial masters. They were carrying the scriptures. Remember, it was in England. England, under the reign of the King James that he declared for the first time that the scriptures be translated from the original tongue into an English language that would be taken among all of their colonies. Come on somebody are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? 
Are you listening to me? Do you see God's plan and God's agenda? The Bible said the word of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the nations as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. Now there are nations that are right in God's plan to be able to play a certain role in bringing that purpose and that prophecy to pass. Hallelujah. The word used here for expected end in Jeremiah is also the word in the Hebrew that means end and expectation. In other words, when we talk about an expected end based on God's plan for your life, in the Hebrew mind it means that God knows that end and he expects it. Hallelujah. God expects that you will walk in your calling. God expects that you'll achieve everything he has anointed you to do. God expects that you'll put your gifts to work and achieve the purpose of God in your generation. Oh my God. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 36. The Bible declares that when David had served the purpose of God in his generation, he was laid to rest and he was raised together with his fathers. When he served the purpose of God in his generation, he rested and he was taken to lay with his fathers. When he served the purpose of God, divine purpose and divine plan. Some people say that Jesus died a premature death because he died at 33. And I don't believe that is true. Because at 33, he had served the purpose of God in his generation. Why was he born? He was born to die. Hallelujah. Come on somebody, hallelujah. I wish... I could hear your answer when I asked that question. Why were you born? Because that's actually what you are here for. All right. That word used for thoughts or plans, makshaba, and I begin to conclude now. It means plans, it means thought, it means purpose, it means device. But I wrote these definitions because of the fifth one, which means invention. In other words, when we talk about divine plan for your life, God is saying, I have a special invention. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I had plans for you and I ordained you. I created an invention for your existence. Like one created a microphone, and another one created a car, and another one created a microwave, and another one created a TV. God had an invention in his mind when he was thinking about you and your existence and your creation because he created you for purpose. For all of you listening to me, under 18, maybe you're under 20, maybe you're 25, you are right in that space to begin to seek God to have a full understanding of what you're created for. Because there are many things you can do in this world, but none of them will ever be as satisfying as a man that has found his purpose. When you find your purpose, you'll be like a hand in a glove. When you find your purpose, you'll be like a square hole carrying a square pole. Many of us live our lives like round holes carrying a square pole. All of your life, it is always frictious. It is always a fight. It is always a battle. It is always a luta continua. It is always the struggle continues. There is a place, ladies and gentlemen, where the full understanding of God's plan has come on your life and you don't have to. The struggle continues because the grace of God on your life makes your life worth living because you are where he needs you to be. You are doing what he needs you to do. You are achieving what he needs you to achieve. They are plans, they are thoughts, they are divine, they are inventions, they are devices. Hallelujah. And it's never too late for you to plug into God's plan. Come on somebody. It's never too late. It must begin at a place of saying yes to the Lord. Because when you say yes to the Lord, you've opened the grand entry of beautiful manifestation. Of God's wonderful plan. Let me show you something I was meditating on and I found quite interesting. In Jeremiah number one, he says, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. In 29, he says, I know the plans I have for you because you see, I knew you and I ordained you. In other words, I created plans because I knew you and I know the plans I have for you. 
when you find that divine plan and walk into that plan, you have walked into divine knowledge, divine existence, because you are in a bubble that God knows. Let me, let me crucify it for you nicely. At the end of time, and in the sense of judgment, those that will not have done the will of the Father, he says, when they come to him, claiming that he must know them, he will say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Because I knew you, and I ordained you to do something. But if you don't do what I ordained, and you don't do my plan, for I know the plan I have for you. You have gone out of the lens of what I know. You are in the space of I never knew you. Because they knew that I knew was ordained to be a prophet. But you, the farmer, I never knew. Because the you, I knew and I ordained. I ordained them to do A, B, C, and D. But the you that lived for 70 years doing X, Y, and Z, I never knew that you. Because the you I knew is the one that I created before you were formed in your mother's womb. And I ordained you to do something. It's critical, my brothers and sisters, that you find the you that God ordained, that you find the you that God appointed, that you find the you that God established. Hallelujah. Because that's the you that is the full manifestation of God's every wonderful thing. Give me five minutes, I'll be out of your way. In Psalm chapter number 22 and verse number 28, the Bible says, For the kingdom is of the Lord, and he is governor among the nations. Because God has a plan for nations. Psalm 67 and verse number 2, That thy way may be known upon the earth, that thy saving health may be known among the nations. Because God has a plan for nations. This is my question. If God has a plan for nations, God has a plan for families because families make nations. If God has a plan for families because families make nations and God has a plan for nations, that means God has a plan for you because families are made of individuals. So the individual plan reveals a family plan that reveals a national plan. That's God's heart. Anytime you as a person, you are walking away from the manifestation of God's will and God's divine agenda, you are sabotaging a greater part of God's plan and understanding because what you carry is connected to what your sister carries. Because if your family carries it, then the nation will be able to carry it. I respect our leaders and I respect political existence and I respect those in authority. We pray for them as the scripture asks us to do. But you know what? The mega manifestation of natural, national responsibility is not by our politicians. Hallelujah. It must be recognized at a personal level of understanding God's will. Because when we know God's will and God's purpose and God's thought, what the Bible is calling divine plan. If you do what you're supposed to do, and I do what I'm supposed to do, at a family level, families will begin to do what they are supposed to do. We will be able to disciple nations. Because that's the will of the Father. What was the great commission? That you go forth and do what? Hallelujah. Make disciples of all nations. Teaching them the things that I've commanded you. Making disciples of all nations. There must be a place where you understand your responsibility in discipleship because that's God's plan. We must stop being afraid of what the world is offering us because it says no man will be able to stand against you to hurt you because I have much people in the city. One of the reasons Jesus has not yet come back is because there's still a lot of people that have not made him their Lord and their Savior and he's giving them a chance. He's winking an eye. He's opening a door of opportunity so that you and me will do our our role in that God's divine plan. Hallelujah. Because if you achieve your purpose, I achieve my purpose. Peradventure Jesus does not have to wait another thousand years. Hallelujah. All right. So for me, 
the concept of God has a plan for me. When he says, I know the plan I have for you. When he says, don't go out of here. Because I have much people in the city. Nobody will be able to hurt you. Stay here. And you stay one and a half years. It becomes very sensitive to me. Because that means to me that God has become personal. He's so personal that he has a clear cut plan for me. He's so personal that he knows me by name. And when my name is called, he knows exactly what he has anointed me for. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? He knows the kind of business he's cut you out for. He knows the kind of life he has cut you out for. He know, I mean, he's designed you exactly for that. Hallelujah. It is so personal that he knows you by name. Teach us to number our days, the psalmist said. And many times I've understood that verse to mean, teach me to number my years and my days so that I may give my heart to wisdom. But I understand it differently now because to number my day is to literally number it up and write it in a diary, write it in a journal and number it from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, from 9 o'clock to midday, from midday to 3 o'clock. I number my day so that I may give my heart to wisdom so that everything I do in my day day is numbered and diarized and journaled according to God's will and God's plan then I'm giving my heart to wisdom if I number my day and anything that is not in out that is not in God's plan for my life is out of that plan now I'm achieving God's will for that day come on and if I number a day, I can number a week, I can number a month, I can number a year. So teach me, Lord, to number my days that I may give my heart to wisdom. There is no greater wisdom in your generation than for you to understand God's plan and purpose for your life and give your life to achieve it. Whatever the cost, whatever the call, whatever the plan, whatever the depth of that plan, God has anointed you for it and you have what it takes to achieve it. Hallelujah. If you're a pen, don't accept to scratch people's heads. Go and draw art. If you're a pen with ink, don't accept to be used for whatever pens are used for. Go and write stories and write aces and write the things that expresses people's mind and their thoughts from their mind onto paper. Come on somebody, hallelujah. I've seen little kids in the streets, in estates and in homes, in the slums here and there. They have these wonderful balloons. But when they blow that balloon, you don't want to look at it. Because when you see it, you can see that the creator and the manufacturer of that balloon did not manufacture it for it to be blown by a kid. Because its shape, its look, its design, it tells you that it has a different purpose. I used to be slow too. You may get that in 2023. Understanding and the pursuit of purpose will preserve you from the dangers of your time. The dangers of your time. The dangers of your time. <laughs> I had a friend, listen to this. He used to say, every time I'm leaving my house, I must pray against Mungiki. I must pray against the Kenya police. I must pray against stray bullets. He had about a four point plan. A four-point plan. And this is my understanding today. That if I can download God's will and his purpose for my life and make it my pursuit and the design of my life, I don't have to pray against Mungiki, against Stray Bullets, and against the Kenya police. Because the design of God's will and plan will keep me preserved. He that dwelleth in the sacred place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. I will say of the Lord, you are my shield, my buckler, my defense, and my rock. A thousand may fall on my right, ten thousand on my left. No evil shall come in my dwelling. Why? Because the sacred place in which I dwell is not a physical place. It is a spiritual place. And part of that place is understanding God's heart for me and allowing that heart to be revealed in my life and committing myself to walk by the revelation of what God's heart is for me. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. 
Can you imagine that Paul could have spent his life in Damascus praying, Lord, give me a wife. Lord, I would like some children. Now, theologians have many stories, and some of them even say that Paul had a wife and children. But Paul understood that God has called him as an apostle to the Gentiles, and that will suffice. That will suffice. You never hear him pray and saying, Lord, give me a wife. Lord, even me, I need a chariot. Lord, even me, I need a plot 50 by 100, at least in Kitengela. Every one of his prayers is about the purpose of his life. He prayed for them that the eyes of their understanding may be enlightened, that they may know what is the, their calling and their purpose and the glory of God in their lives. Every one of his burden, the burden on his heart was about purpose. And I tell you what, but Paul did not die out of time. As a matter of fact, we were discussing with Eddie last night. Paul is one of the few guys that stands and tells the church in Philippi, guys, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be poured as a drink offering. But you know what? For me to stay is a greater benefit for you. So even though my going is better, I'm going to hold it so that I stay with you a few more years because it's beneficial. When you work God's will and you do God's plan and you walk your life by God's agenda, you can manage your life that you can even choose when to check out. You can choose when to check out. A man that God's, does God's will is so precious to God that heaven and earth will defend you because you are achieving the revelation of God's plan. Hallelujah. Let me ask you a question. If you go out of God's plan and begin to do your things, is he mandated to cover you? Is he mandated to cover you? He has anointed you. You are big. You are strong. You can do mighty things. Samson. But if you lay your head in Delilah's lap, as big and as strong as God's anointing is on your life, the narrative is going to change. Because it is in his space that you will be preserved. It is in his will that you will be covered. It is in his will that your faith will be at work. Some of us say, I have faith. I believe God for years. Things are not happening in my life. Faith begins where the will of God is known. And outside of God's will, you cannot exercise faith. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, my cry and my plea and my desire and my beseechment today is that our heart will go back to a thirsty place of knowing God's will, God's plan, God's agenda for your life. Put your hands together. Give him a hand of praise. Let me read you that verse in two or three versions and rewind it out. Number one, the easy English says, I want to do many good things for you, saith the Lord. Meaning, I know, I know the plans I have for you. He says, I want you to become rich and strong. And I don't want you to, I don't want to hurt you. I want you to believe that you will have a good and a future life. God has a plan for you. His plan is good and not evil. He's working for you and not against you. That is fundamental for your faith because now you can trust God. Many of us don't have capacity to trust God, not because he's God and we don't care, but we are so afraid of him because we don't know what his plan is for us. We feel like one of these days he's going to just cut you in your mistake and crush you once and for all. We are so afraid of him that we cannot trust him. But the scriptures say, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And I will finish on that. Because your own understanding is always the tragedy and the resistance of the acceptance of God's will. Because your understanding is always against what God is trying to get you to understand. So to trust God is to lay aside your understanding. So that you can trust him with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him that it is you that I'm alive today. It is you that there is breath in my nostrils. It is you that I'm here where I am today. It is Ebenezer, the Lord God, that has brought me this far. I may not be all that I dream to be, but it is God that has brought me here. I must acknowledge that it is the hand of God and not the hand of a man. Hallelujah. And then he will direct your path. One version says he will make your crooked path straight because your path are always crooked outside of God's will. Always crooked. I don't care how smart your plans are. Five year plan, seven year plan, 35 year plan. I mean you have grand plans but you know what? 
it must align to divine plan. Heaven has planned. Don't belabor planning so hard outside of what heaven has planned. Try to understand what heaven has planned and let your plan be based on what heaven has planned. God told Moses that you will build a tabernacle based on the plan and the pattern that you saw in the mountain. One of the reasons God took Moses to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights was so that he can behold the plan, so that he can behold the plan, so that he can behold the plan, so that he can understand God's thoughts, so that he can understand God's heart, so that he can understand God's burden for his people. And he says, when you go down, you will build the tabernacle according to plan. The tragedy of our generation is that we are busy building tabernacles based on human plan. Can you imagine if Noah tried to build the ark based on his plan? He's never seen rain. He's never seen an ocean. He's never seen anything that floats. If he's going to build an ark, it has to be based on God's plan. Now you will be surprised that the many years of Noah's life, by divine plan, was to build that ark. So that eight souls and pairs of animals may be saved. So that God may have a new beginning. I wonder what God's plan is for your life. Because I have no doubt that God has a plan. I know you are only 15, that God has a plan. Maybe you are 25, God has a plan. You are about to get married. God even has a plan for your marriage. Can you imagine that? You think you're just getting married. But in God's plan, he knows that the children you're going to bear will be apostles and prophets. And they will carry the presence of God in their generation. You're excited about a wife. But God is giving you more than a wife. He's looking at a salvation of a generation. Somebody say hallelujah. The ISV says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your well-being and not for calamity. In order to give you a future and a hope. If you thought God was planning calamity for you, I want to break your heart. Because calamity is not part of God's plan for you. It's not part of God's plan. It's not part of God's plan. Anytime you see calamity, the evil one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy has been given space in your life. Either by being out of God's will or for whatever reason you may be. And he has come to strike where God had defended. I feel like I'm adding to your life this afternoon a nugget that could preserve you longer than you thought you would live. Are you listening to me? I said, are you listening to me? Because committing your life to walk by God's plan will keep you from error that cuts short people's lives. Will keep you from errors that derail people and cause them to walk away from God. Do you know there are people that have known God? They've seen dreams and visions. They've been visited by angels. They've been touched by the Holy Spirit. And yet five years later, they pack their bags and they say no more. No more church. No more salvation. No, I mean they go and begin to live such a wicked life. Because their heart could not perceive God's plan. And to believe and to trust God. That is good enough to keep his word and do in their lives what he has promised them that he will do hallelujah all right i give you the message and then we read isaiah 55 and we are done the message says i know what i'm doing i have it planned out plans to take care of you and not to abandon you plans to give you a future and to give you a hope he said in one place, I will never forsake you and I will never leave you. He says, even unto the end of the age, I will never forsake you. So he says his plan is not to abandon you. Your own father could have abandoned you. God will not. Ah, I feel like I'm talking to myself now. Hallelujah. I mean, you, the Bible says, even a mother with a sucking child may forget their baby and yet say to the Lord, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Why does God speak in such a prophetic manner concerning your life and his purpose for your life? Because God wants you to trust him. When you trust him, you will trust his purpose. 
you will trust his will. When he says, come out of the boat, because it is the Lord that is calling, you know that you will not sink because Jehovah has called. If another man calls, don't try to come out of that boat. If it's a president of Kenya calling, don't you try to come out of that boat because you will sink. But if it is God that is calling, ladies and gentlemen, God is trustworthy. And the reason we must know that is believable and trustable is so that we can trust him with his will and be able to walk in his will and his plan with confidence that God will not abandon us. Life has treated you so unfairly that every time you think about God, you feel like he's left you high and dry. He's left you to fend for yourself. He's left you to fight for yourself. That's not the God of Israel. And that's not the God we preach. That's not the God of the Bible. Somebody say hallelujah. He will watch over you. He will sustain your life. He will watch over you in the dark days of your life, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Bible says, I will fear no evil because I know that my God is with me. If we don't learn to trust God, we will not reach out to catch divine plan, to catch divine purpose. God has a mega plan for your life. And many times you live short of that life because we don't have capacity to trust him for it. The next time God says, come, may you have the confidence and the grace to go because nothing greater than God's call in your life. Let's finish with Isaiah 55. And then we read verse number six. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. What does to seek the Lord mean? He said, let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. For our God will abundantly pardon. Hey. Now, listen to that verse a little bit. I want you to see something there. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to the Lord our God for he will abundantly pardon. Listen to this. The unrighteous man must forsake his thoughts. The wicked must forsake his ways. What are the thoughts of the wicked man? The thoughts of the wicked man are that he cannot return to the Lord because the Lord will not have mercy on him because God cannot pardon. That is a wicked thought pattern. To think that God cannot pardon your wickedness. To think that God cannot take you out of the gutter and the pain of your life. To think that God cannot take you out of your past, out of your yesterday, and out of the pain of the days gone by. That's a wicked thought plan. That's a wicked thought plan. And I will say it again. He calls it, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Because until you forsake your thoughts, you will not be able to catch God's thoughts. Your mind is full of thoughts. The problem is, they are your thoughts. They are your grandfather's thoughts. They are your grandmother's thoughts. Your grandmother told you you are good for nothing. Your grandfather told you girls are helpless and hopeless. Your own father told you you will never grow to achieve anything. And all those are thoughts in your mind. They have created a plan that has become a plan of your life. When you think you are not beautiful, it's not because someone told you you are not beautiful. It's because you think you are not beautiful. Outside of God's will, the wicked must forsake his thoughts. The unrighteous must forsake his ways because your thoughts will always lead you to ways. They commit suicide because they've been thinking about it all day long. They commit fornication because they've been thinking about it all day long. They commit everything they do because they've been thinking about it all day long. If a man will change his thoughts, he will change his ways. Come on. What has that got to do with God's will? Let me finish. Verse number 8, the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. 
My God. Verse number nine. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts farther than your thoughts. Ha! Huh. Because you see, your thoughts have been created based on a, on a pattern of wickedness, based on your environment and your earthly establishment. But God says, your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. If we can get our thoughts, God's thoughts to become our thoughts, we will get God's ways to become our ways. Outside of God's plan, he says as the east is far from the west, so are my thoughts far from your thoughts, and my ways past finding out. Your responsibility, therefore, is to begin to pack your bags and leave the east and begin to walk to the west because your mind must comprehend the mind of God and the mind of Christ. And your ways must be aligned based on the thoughts that you download from heaven above. If you've been thinking you are not beautiful, you must begin to think the beauty of God is upon me. I am beautiful. I am favored. I am rich. I am prosperous. I am not sick. I live a full life. My children are blessed. My life is blessed. My finances are blessed. My dreams are blessed. But you see, all of your life you've been thinking you are cursed. You are cursed. You are living a curse. Your life is broken. Your children will never make it. Your, your, your parent never made it. You will never see the light of day. Those thoughts are not God's thoughts. And if you walk by those thoughts, you will never walk in the ways of God. If you are going to walk by divine plan, you must begin to understand what God is saying. He appeared to Paul by night in a vision. And he said, don't leave Corinth. I need you here. I have much people in this city. Nobody will hurt you or persecute you or prosecute you. Stay here because I have a purpose for you here. And the man stayed for one and a half years. And this is the question. I wonder where you have stayed the last one and a half years because God said you should stay. I mean, some of us have trouble staying at church. <laughs> Forget business and the workplace. We just have trouble staying at church. We must access divine wisdom that reveals plan and once we know that plan then yield ourselves to it with all of our lives let me tell you there is nothing good that God will keep away from you he's a son and he's a shield he gives grace and he gives glory that is Psalm 84 God will give you grace and God will give you glory when you yield yourself to his will Jesus prayed and he said not my will but your will be done it's as if everything in him was telling him you don't have to die but the will of the father was that he must die because if he doesn't die there is no salvation for humanity in spite of the cost and the pain he endured and despised the cross because he received the father's will and the father's plan above his own plan his will and his agenda when Peter told him in one place you will not die they will not kill you we will fight for you he told them get thou behind me Satan because thou severest not the things that be of God but the things that be of man Peter was thinking the thoughts of men when Jesus was thinking the thoughts of God what I'm telling you today, and I know I've stretched it a little bit, is that you must begin to think the thoughts of God. I talked about numbering your days, and that God will teach you to number your days. Tomorrow when you wake up, before you go to the bathroom, before you brush your teeth, before you run into anything, before you check your social media, before you reach out your phone to check what message it came in the night, take a moment and close your eyes, and let the Lord teach you to number tomorrow that nothing outside of God's plan will have access into your space. If there are things on your phone that lead you out of God's will, block them off. If there are things in your house that lead you out of God's will, block them off. If there are friends in your life that draw you out of God's will, delete them in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Delete them. Forget them. Take them out of your space. Because if God is going to teach you to number your days, the numbering of your days is to keep you aligned in his will, in his plan, so that you'll achieve his pursuit and his agenda for your life. When you are done with the purpose of God for your generation, you can lay down with your fathers and we will bless God for the rest of your life that you lived. 
There is no doubt that every one of us will go six feet under the ground. Maybe in Langata or somewhere. We'll take you to your father's burial ground. If the Lord tarries, they will put a cross there and they will say, sunrise, 19 that, sunset, 2000 and that. They will say, born such and such a day, died such and such a day. What I'm talking to you today is the dash between those two deaths. Because I don't care what you do and how great you become at it. If that dash is not filled with God's purpose, God's plan, and God's agenda, you lived an empty life. I'm sorry to be the one to break your heart. If the dash between your birthday and your death day does not reveal God's plan in your life and his purpose and access to his wisdom, to his thoughts, so that your life reveals God's heart. You've wasted a life that another could have lived. You've wasted a life that God has no celebration for. Come on, hallelujah. I say, come on, hallelujah. If God gives you another day, dedicate that day to his plan. If God gives you some money, and some of you are going to be really rich, I have no doubt about that. Dedicate that money to God's plan. I've committed myself that my money and my finances are finances on a mission, money on a mission, because every time it comes to my hands, it's because God wants to achieve something. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. For as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Listen to verse number 10. For as the rain comes down from heaven, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth, and to burn, and to give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Verse number 11. So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing where I send it. From today, you must look at the word of God as a different agency. As an agency of change and not just ink on paper. Because the Bible says, as the rain cometh from heaven and reaches down the earth and causes the plants to grow and the grass to burn and things to grow out of the earth, so shall my word be. Ladies and gentlemen, as the word of God is coming from heaven, it is coming down on your heart with the purpose to change your thoughts to change your ways to change your heart to change your mind so that you'll begin to think the mind of God the thoughts of God the purpose of God the plan of God because if God can get you to do that his word will achieve his purpose he says it gives seed to the sower and it gives bread to the eater he says it achieves the purpose for which I sent it what am I trying to say today? I want your heart to be fallow ground. I want your heart to be ready to produce seed and bread. That's why God is sending forth his word because it must achieve whatever he sent it for. The word of God is never sent in vain. It is sent to achieve. Your life is still a high cost of low living because you are living outside of God's plan. Your life is full of heartbreaks and pain and sorrow after sorrow because you're still walking outside of God's plan. Your life has been a burden of your life. I've had to fight all my days because you've stayed out of God's plan. Let me tell you something. When you are in God's plan, even hard tasks become easy. You will do heavy things that kill people. And everybody will wonder, how can you carry such a burden? You say it is easy because you are in God's plan. I feel sorry for people that try to pastor and try to do ministry work out of their ego and macho and strength. I feel sorry because I don't know how you can carry the burden and the pain we bear if it's not for the grace that is availed in God's will. I tell you what, outside of God's will, I would never be able to do what I do. 
outside of God's will. I would have never had the courage to leave my motherland and go live in another country, try to pass the people whose language I cannot even speak. I mean, who bears such a burden? But the grace of God that revealed in his own plan. As I talk, I feel my burden going out. 18 year old, 25 year old, maybe you're 26, maybe you are in your first job, maybe you are hoping to get married someday. One of the greatest messages you'll hear for the rest of your life, apart from receiving Jesus as Lord of your life, is what I've spoken in this pulpit today. That the knowledge of God's will, his purpose, and his plan for your life must become the alignment and the plumb line for every day that you live for the rest of your days the next business that you do must be based on that your marriage as you get into marriage must be based on that your your life goal must be based on that when I ask you what do you see in the future don't just tell me I want to be a doctor I want to be a pilot because everybody want to be a pilot a doctor these days kids say I want to be a pastor don't just be pastor because they hold the mic and the lights are on and the glamour is on and everybody sitting listening to them take some time and understand God's plan. God's plan will keep you from tears. God's plan will turn your sorrow into joy. Some of us were born and raised in sorrow and yet our lives are turned around because of giving our lives to God's plan. My God, my God, my God, my God. God will give you things you never deserved because the greatest credential you can ever give back to God is to do his will. When Jesus was teaching them to pray, he said, pray, our Father who art in heaven, allow it be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. The greatest thing you can ever give back to God is not your money. The greatest thing you can ever give back to God is not your work to come and serve in the church. It's to first of all give him your will and sacrifice your will at his altar. Because when you do that, you are ready to bring his will to be done in your life. And when your life gets to that place, God will trust you with anything. God will trust you with anything. God will trust you with anything. We struggle in our lives that we get to a place where we are able to trust God. I want to move from that space and I want to come to a place where God can trust me. Forget me trying to trust God. I want God to trust me. Because when he checks on my heart, it's dead to natural things. When he checks on my will, it's dead. I don't desire because I want. Glory to God. Anything that comes in my life, I want to check the heartbeat of God and what he says concerning that. It's not the figures on the check. It's not the, the weight of the presentation. It's not, the, it's not the size of what I have in it. The world has taught us to ask, what is my cut in it? And if my cut is not big enough, I will not get involved. My question will change to what is God's heart in it? What's God's purpose on this matter? Because then God will send his word. And when he sends his word, it will not return to him void. It will accomplish that which he please. Listen to what verse number 12 says. He says, for you shall go out with joy and you shall be led out in peace. The mountain and the hills will break forth before you in singing. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of thorns, there will come a mato tree. Instead of a briar, there will come a mato tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name and an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The will of God established in your life is going to have results because the mountains will clap. The, 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 the animals on the mountains will dance. The, the trees on the mountains will clap their hands. He says thorn trees will become matter trees. The briars will become matter trees. What was unfruitful will become fruitful. What was dry will become productive because a man has healed his life into the will and the plan of God. And the word of God finally it has effect on the hearts of men. The Bible says, listen to this, the last verse. It says, all that shall be because God will cause it to become an ensign. It will become like a road sign. It will become, we'll look at your life and your life has become a sign that there is a God in heaven. 
We look at your life and your life has become a sign that we must believe in miracles. If anybody don't believe in miracles, look at my life and how much God has done and how much he has achieved with a thing like this and see the miracles of God in my life. He says when those things begin to pass in your life, I will make a name for the Lord and an everlasting sign that will not be destroyed because the will of God, the counsel and the plan of God in your life will achieve for God a sign in your generation. There are people that will never believe that there is a God in heaven until they see what that God has done in your own life. Hallelujah. I feel like I've labored a heaven today. My essentially, I thought I would teach, it looks like I've gone the preaching direction. But the purpose of tonight is to get the rest of your life on purpose. That you'll never live another day in vain. Listen to me, I'm about to pray and we're going to go home. But this is your pastor's prayer. That you'll never live another day in vain. That you'll not look for energy from other spaces. That you'll not look for comfort from other places. No greater comfort than in the place where God applauds you because you're in a place he needs you to be. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Why is the father pleased with his son? Because he counted it not robbery to leave the glories of heaven above. I mean, if, I mean, Philippians chapter number two. But he gave himself to die, even the death of the cross. He says in verse number 10, therefore has the Lord given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father because he found a part of himself that could yield himself to the will of God. What Jesus did is what God is looking for every man to do. You are not here to achieve your will because your will is full of error. Your will is broken. Your will is fainted. Your will is dirty. You, I mean, if we give you to your will, you will kill some people and be happy. But God is calling you to the space of his will that I call divine plan. These guys have embarrassed you. They have blasphemed the gospel. They feel they don't want to receive the gospel anymore. Your own will feels, let me wash my hands, leave this city. I will look for the Gentiles. God knocks your bed by night. He said, don't leave this place. I need you here for one and a half years because I have much people in this city. Your will against God's will. Today, I want you to align your life. There are many things that are going to get aligned. Many things that are going to get aligned as you commit yourself to God's will and God's plan. Ephesians chapter number 2, the Bible declares that you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he before ordained. I mean, verse number 10, that you should walk in them. Can you listen to that? I finish with that verse. He says, for we are his workmanship. We are not our own workmanship. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus and to good works he, which he before has ordained that we should walk in them. Ladies and gentlemen, the works in which you should be walking today were ordained a long time ago before you were formed in your mother's womb. They were ordained before. Before. That before actually means before the creation of the universe. Jesus was crucified for the salvation of humanity. And the scripture says he was crucified before the foundation of the world. Can you see that parallel? The same way Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. And yet in the mind of God, that transaction happened before the foundation of the world. There are transactions in the mind of God concerning you that happened before the foundation of the world. He before ordained that you should walk in them. Your responsibility, therefore, is to realign your life. As you go home today, I'm not telling you to pray and to fast and to take some time before God. I'm just asking you to be humble and give yourself before God. Come off of your high horse, of your mind and, and battling thoughts of, uh, of the things you want to achieve. And take some time and ask God for his will and purpose for your life. Because you'll be surprised. He will show you simple things that will change your life forever. Like don't leave this place, stay here another one and a half years because I have much people in the city. Those much people, they are the people that became the church of Corinth. Church in Corinth. 
God will speak to you. Things about your family, things about your children, things about your business. You are running so hard and achieving so little because you've not taken time to find in which direction God wants to run. God will give you a nugget of wisdom because you are his workmanship. What he tells you to do will lead you into a space that you'll never be able to define and it could change your life forever. Stand up on your feet in the blessed name of Jesus.